Following the genetic roadmap, destination unknown, scientists unveil the human genome with hopes for a medical revolution and fears of misused knowledge. A trillion reasons to smile. America's good fortune leads to plans that could help everyone. And secret files opened to reveal who knew what about the Holocaust threat against Europe's Jews. This is the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather reporting from CBS News headquarters in New York. Good evening. History will mark this day as a milestone in medicine and science. Researchers have decoded the human genome. That's the sequence of billions of DNA fragments that are the recipe for humankind. This breakthrough knowledge about our genes is expected to revolutionize the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disease. It also raises questions about what is medically possible, desirable, and ethical. CBS's in-depth coverage begins with Elizabeth Callerton. It's what makes us all alike and unique at the same time, our genetic code. And scientists today, along with President Clinton, announced they have cracked that code for the first time. Today we are learning the language in which God created life. And what is that language? It's called the human genome. In simplest terms, a genetic instruction manual for life. We develop as human beings because each and every one of our genes comes with instructions on what function it should perform, from building bones to muscle to skin and hair. Those genetic instructions found in our DNA are scrambled together in a four-letter alphabet. Sequencing the genome means putting that genetic alphabet, all 3.2 billion letters, in order so they can be read. The feat was achieved by competing groups, public and private, who say the work was only made possible by the development of powerful machines capable of breaking down and reading DNA in seconds. We've managed to do in nine months what it would thought, thought it was going to take 15 or 20 years to do. But the real work is yet to come. Dr. James Watson first identified the structure of DNA. We've got the book. Now we want to learn how to read it. Once mastered, the strange new text will spell out genes and, more important, genetic malfunctions. We're going to understand disease better. So medicine will improve. It won't happen overnight. The gene for cystic fibrosis was discovered 10 years ago. There's no cure yet, but... We actually have about 15 different uh, products and treatments in clinical trials as we speak. Doctors will also be able to identify who is at risk for certain inherited diseases, such as cancer and Alzheimer's, leading to early detection and treatment. Though we shouldn't be promising that cures will flow immediately from this, but we can promise that knowledge and understanding of real causes, not just symptoms of disease, should become available from this. Scientists believe even this first rough draft of the sequence genome provides a new foundation for knowledge that will change the face of medicine. Completing the work is clearly more of a beginning than an end. Dan? Elizabeth Callaghan, thanks. Among genome-based drugs already or soon to be tested in humans, a treatment to ease the side effects of chemotherapy, another to treat blocked arteries, and a protein to restore the body's ability to fight infections. Much more to come. But there is a dark side, like being denied health insurance because of a genetic risk, you might develop a disease. Think it can't happen? It already has. CBS's Wyatt Andrews has been investigating. The future of genetic medicine may sound terrific, but to Sandra Thomas, it's also a threat. Here's why. She lost her health insurance because she has the gene for the life-threatening blood disease hemochromatosis. Not the disease itself, just the gene. So why did they do it? Because my mother had a hereditary disease and they assumed that I was going to have it too. Today, she's head of the American Hemochromatosis Society, and every day she hears from another member facing a no-win catch-22. Have you had genetic testing? If you and test for the disease, out. it can save your life, but also risk your insurance or your job. But it's a vicious cycle. If you're afraid to be tested, how are you going to get an early diagnosis? 
we should fix this. We should fix it now. No less than the chief of the government's genome project, Dr. Francis Collins, calls this a grave concern for science. The very promise of genetic medicine depends on individual diagnostic tests to reveal the genetic glitches every human being carries. If no one submits to tests, gene medicine goes nowhere. If we do not put the protections in place, to avoid breaches of privacy and to protect against discrimination, and if we do not do it soon, this revolution in medicine could be stillborn. Congress has banned genetic discrimination against workers who have group health insurance, but those who buy individual policies and they're an exploding part of the workforce are still vulnerable. We've reached a point where we can't just talk about it anymore. There's a bill in Congress to protect individual buyers, but it's been blocked for five years. Health insurance companies oppose individual privacy protections, saying they need patient information to assess risk. To Sandra Thomas and to millions of patients, the greatest obstacle now to the new world of medicine is an old world concern for privacy. Wyatt Andrews, CBS News, Delray Beach, Florida. Underscoring that concern about privacy, 75% in a Time magazine poll published today say they would not want their health insurance company to have access to their genetic data. Even by government standards, a trillion dollars is a lot of money. Today, the president announced that because of America's strong economy over the past six to eight years, in the next 10 years, the federal surplus will be over a trillion dollars bigger than previously estimated. Now, as CBS's John Roberts reports, comes the fight over how to spend it. This is a great day for America. A great day first indeed. Medicine. For the first time since the 1940s, America's piggy bank is full to overflowing with multi-year budget surpluses. It really has been decades and decades, perhaps never before, has the U.S. economy performed as well as it has performed over the last few years. Today's revised estimates project the surplus could total $1.9 trillion in the next decade and allow America to retire the debt a year earlier in 2012. No question, all that money is burning a hole in the pockets of politicians. Well, we could have a bidding war among congressional and presidential candidates to spend money and to cut taxes. Already the bidding has begun. Today the president dipped into the surplus to offer Republicans a deal. He'll sign their bill to eliminate the marriage tax penalty if they pass his prescription drug plan for Medicare. The cost? $500 billion. But that's nothing compared to what the candidates are offering. Gore's plans for a Medicare lockbox, targeted tax cuts, prescription drugs, and other spending would cost $1.75 trillion. Bush's proposals for a bigger tax cut, health education and environment, and other programs total $1.8 trillion. While their spending programs differ, they both nearly empty the surplus piggy bank. And there's still four months to the election. Now, I want to remind the people, however, that this is just a budget projection. It would not be prudent to commit every penalty of a future surplus that is just a projection and therefore subject to change. Running surpluses keeps interest rates low and the economy humming. It also makes for generous politicians who will show you just how quickly they can make it disappear. Dan? John Roberts. Still ahead on tonight's CBS Evening News, the Supreme Court speaks out on your right to remain silent. And later, SUVs. High gasoline prices won't put the brakes on this booming business. The U.S. Supreme Court today gave strong new backing to the 1966 ruling that requires police to read citizens suspected of crimes their rights. Ruling 7-2, the justices pumped up the volume on the right to remain silent. CBS's Jim Stewart is on the case and has the context. Taking the approach that if it's not broken, don't fix it, the Supreme Court today ruled that the Miranda warning Before we ask you any questions, you must understand your rights. which requires police to inform suspects they can remain silent was a good idea when the court ordered it 34 years ago and remains a good idea today. Besides, Chief Justice William Rehnquist wrote, Miranda has become embedded in routine police practice to the point where the warnings have become part of our national culture. We declined to overrule it. The decision was a disappointment for conservatives who felt that sometimes perfectly good confessions were being thrown out on technicalities. That's what happened in the case of Nathan Ramirez. When I'm ATS, I'm Nathan Ramirez. I don't have to speak with anyone regarding any criminal activity without an attorney present. 
He confessed to a Florida kidnap and murder, but did so before he was read his Miranda rights. His conviction was later kicked out, as was the confession of Carlos Sampson, who admitted killing his daughter. Miranda opponents say it's those kinds of miscarriages that illustrate why the warning needed an overhaul. The net result of the court's decision will be that thousands of dangerous confessed criminals will go free uh, because police officers have made some kind of mistake in delivering the Miranda warnings. It is a risk and mistakes do happen, but most cops now grudgingly agree that Miranda works. And most law enforcement, including the FBI, had already decided to keep reading suspects their rights, no matter what today's decision was. Jim Stewart, CBS News, at the Supreme Court. Also in the Supreme Court today, lawyers for the Miami relatives of six-year-old Cuban castaway Elian Gonzalez filed what may be their last appeal. It asked Justice Anthony Kennedy to keep the boy in this country until the whole court reviews the case. If Kennedy says no, Juan Miguel Gonzalez would be free to take his son home to Cuba as early as Wednesday afternoon. In Southern Africa, the first results are in from Zimbabwe's elections and government opponents are celebrating. They expect major gains after the hardest fought vote in the country's 20 year history. Zimbabwe officials say vote counting is going slowly because so many people voted. Twice as many as in any previous election there. International observers have condemned President Robert Mugabe's government because of pre-election violence against the opposition party. Japan's prime minister is promising no new economic policies despite a narrow election victory. But his so-called Liberal Democratic Party's ruling coalition lost dozens of parliamentary seats as many voters expressed their worries over the still sagging Japanese economy. The Liberal Democrats have ruled Japan almost continuously for the past 50 years. A strike by air traffic controllers in France today virtually shut down air travel into, out of, and over that country. Controllers call the 24-hour walkout to protest planned European Union reforms the French say will cost them their jobs. Ahead, CBS's Eye on America reports on SUVs. You won't believe who's making one now. The CBS Evening News and tonight's Eye on America segment are sponsored by Tylenol. Take comfort in our strength. The CBS Price Watch shows gasoline prices down a bit, but still pretty high. The national average for regular is $1.65 a gallon, down from $1.68 last week. The top average in parts of the Midwest with tight pollution rules is $1.92. Still, prices are high, so Americans must want cars that get good gas mileage, right? Wrong, as CBS's Bob Orr found for this Eye on America report. How hot is the market for sport utility vehicles? Just ask Porsche President Fred Schwab. Well, we're going to be the first SUV that's fathered by a sports car. That's right, Porsche, famous for sleek, high-performance sports cars, is about to add a little utility. CBS News has obtained these spy photos of Porsche's first SUV, disguised here for sale in 2002. This SUV market is for real. It's here. It's here to stay. And that's in spite of spiking gasoline prices. Drivers willing to shell out $30,000 and more for gas guzzling sport utilities simply aren't phased by $2 a gallon gas. I wouldn't even know what the price of the gallon is really. I'm not paying that much attention. I just know it's more of it. For me, it's style and comfort. In fact, SUV sales have risen right along with gas prices. May sales of small sport utility vehicles were up 8.3% over a year ago. And get this, the sales of larger, less fuel-efficient ones rose even more, up 9.6%. The gas price surge has not affected sales of SUVs and IOTA. The big ones keep selling strong, the small ones keep selling strong. People just love to buy these vehicles. The market is so strong that the world's largest car maker, General Motors, says it's going to make fewer small, inexpensive cars and more minivans, pickup trucks, and SUVs. So when will the SUV craze end? What's probably going to drive people ultimately back into cars is the fact that everyone's got a sport utility and finally someone's going to say, I want something different, I want a passenger car. But for now, automakers who make big money on sport utility vehicles see nothing coming down the road to end America's love affair with SUVs. In Washington, I'm Bob Orr for Eye on America.
On the CBS Market Watch, a big new merger in the food products industry. Philip Morris, the tobacco giant, is adding Nabisco to its Kraft Foods division. The nearly $15 billion deal is expected to make Kraft the world's most profitable food company. Stocks were up on Wall Street today. The Dow Industrials rose 138 points. The Nasdaq gained 66. Remembering that we should never forget when we think about the nightmare of the Holocaust, we often wish that someone somewhere could have done something to stop it. Now, secret documents from World War II, just declassified, tell us more about what some U.S. and British leaders knew at the time. CBS's Eric Ingberg has the facts. October of 1943, American and British forces have landed in Italy and are moving on roll. In a coded radio message to SS leaders in Rome, Hitler orders the slaughter of the city's Jews. October 6, treatment of Italian Jews. Take to northern Italy the 8,000 Jews living in Rome. They are to be liquidated. Emerging only today from the top secret war files of the Allies is that they knew at the time a slaughter had been ordered. The order was uh, intercepted by the British and shared with the Americans in London in the middle of October 1943. The information went first to the Office of Strategic Services, the U.S. spy agency of the time, then often direct to President Roosevelt. October 11th, Berlin to Rome, ordering the immediate and thorough eradication of the Jews in Italy. 1,000 Roman Jews would die in Auschwitz. It's clear now they could have been warned. Roosevelt and Churchill, faced with the problems of fighting a war, apparently never even discussed that. There was a fear that if you let the Germans know you could read their mail, they would tighten their cipher security. The 1998 War Crimes Disclosure Act seeks to make public intelligence information that countries often fight to keep secret even years after the war. These records are, are filled with what are called sources and methods, the names of agents and intelligence gathering methods, also filled with foreign government information. 400,000 pages were declassified today and more are coming, almost surely revealing more controversial decisions by the leaders who fought Hitler. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Washington. The seven major cigar makers today agreed to put government health warning labels on their products. Look for them by the end of the year. Five rotating warnings from the Surgeon General. One says secondhand cigar smoke is a health hazard to non-smokers. Another warns that cigars can cause mouth and throat cancer even if you don't inhale. Next year on CBS, the State of the Union that President Clinton has yet to address in person. We leave you this evening with news about the most traveled president in U.S. history and where he hasn't managed to go in seven and a half years in office. Is it someplace distant, exotic, or dangerous? You decide. CBS's Richard Schlesinger has been there. Nebraska is unique in at least three ways. It's number one in beef production. It's the only state with a single chamber legislature. And it's the only state Bill Clinton has never visited as president. He's welcome here anytime to, to come and visit us. Buffalo girls, won't you come out tonight, come out tonight. Nebraskans think they have just the thing to attract Mr. Clinton. Steve Goff runs a new museum built over Interstate 80 in Kearney, Nebraska. It may look like the middle of nowhere, but it's actually in the middle of what was the great westward migration of the early 1800s. <laughs> All the wagon trains passed through here. The Pony Express passed through here. And, a lot of uh, people passed through. They did. They passed through. Some, some were smart enough to stay. Goff and others here want the president to attend the official opening of the Archway exhibits. A Clinton visit to this museum could be the perfect way to end the state's presidential isolation. This is, after all, a monument to people who passed through without staying. Mr. Clinton has passed over the state many times and passed up every opportunity to stop by. But a lot of people hope the president follows the example of the pioneers and keeps on moving right through the state. I guess I'm saying don't come. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're happy enough to be the only state that he's never visited. That's kind of a badge of honor, really, as far as I'm concerned. The White House says the president will probably not go to the museum dedication, but his very diplomatic spokesman promises Mr. Clinton will get to the everyone. state.
he wants to go to Nebraska, and in the greatest American spirit of saving the best for last, he intends <laughs> to get to Nebraska before uh, his term ends. We will miss your bright eyes and sweet smile. A presidential stopover can't come soon enough for Nebraskans who worry people could get the wrong message from the White House that Nebraska is the last place anyone would want to visit. Richard Schlesinger, CBS News, Kearney, Nebraska. And that's part of our world tonight. I'll be back later tonight with 48 Hours. Here's a preview. One small town, five unsolved murders. We all are a little nervous. Why can't the police solve this case? I think it's somebody from in town. I think it's a person that was raised here. The Ghosts of Mississippi, later on 48 Hours. Special 48 Hours Mystery tonight at 10, 9 Central Time. For the CBS Evening News, Dan Rather reporting. See you again soon on 48 Hours. Good night. For news 24 hours a day, CBS.com on the Internet and on our interactive partner, America Online, at keyword CBS News. Laser eye surgery. Are doctors in too big a hurry? Tomorrow, experience CBS News.